Welcome to NILA 2020 On Demand. This session was previously recorded for the NILA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter contact information have been archived in a Google folder and are made available after conference. Support files and documents can be found in the sessions files below the program description. Any questions about the NILA 2020 virtual conference digital platform can be directed to Christina at NILA.org, or you can call 800-252-6952. Welcome to Submitting and Preparing Engaging Conference Presentations. I'm Joshua Taylor, and while I hold an MLS and I have practiced as a librarian, I currently lead a nonprofit organization that has to do with genealogy and family history in New York City. That being said, I give a variety of different conference presentations, and one of the things that I admire most about anyone's sort of courage to participate in public speaking is the fact that they have made that decision. They've, they've stepped up and they're ready to share what they know with their peers and with their colleagues. But oftentimes the steps to submit and prepare that conference presentation can be a bit murky. They might be a bit unclear. Sometimes we wonder where to start. And sometimes after a while, we wonder how do we keep ensuring that I'm producing an engaging and lively conference presentation? So during our time together, we're going to look at three main components of preparing and submitting engaging conference presentations. The first is discussing the art of the topic. The second will focus specifically on submitting a presentation. And finally, we'll look at delivery and execution of that presentation. So again, we're gonna look at the art of the topic. We'll look at submitting a presentation. And finally, we'll end with delivery and execution. So first, let's look at the art of the topic. Think back to a recent conference that you attended, either online or perhaps in person, and think about the topics that inspired you the most. What was it about that topic that really made you think about it when I first mentioned thinking of a topic, right? What was it that, that stuck with you? What did you take back to your library or to your colleagues and share immediately? Was it the speaker themselves? Was it the topic? Was it a handout? Was it a couple of quotes that, that were good for your entire team to learn? What really was it about that presentation that really inspired you to remember it as one of your favorite recent presentations? In many cases, it's a combination of everything. Sometimes the, world best, the world's best speakers who are preparing a interesting topic that they might not be familiar with or might not be as comfortable with delivering can give a horrendous presentation. And sometimes those who are the most knowledgeable about a specific topic are not the best person or people to engage in that in a public speaking setting. So it just depends on the situation and the skill sets and some of the interests of that particular individual. But it all starts with the art of the topic. What should a topic really do as you're working to prepare it for submission? Topics should do one of four things. Ideally, it should do all four of these. But sometimes when we look at a topic idea, we're so excited to present on that particular subject or topic that we forget to look at the wider picture of how that submission might play into an overall conference or an overall event. The best topics, first and foremost, will grab an audience. There's nothing better than an engaging title that either piques interest, perhaps gives a, a little bit of an insight onto the type of presentation it might be. Is this going to be humorous? Is this going to be very, very serious? But the best topics, of course, grab an audience. With that, the best topics are also flexible and adaptable. In other words, they're topics that someone can listen to and then take back to their own library, their own institution, and begin applying immediately. You might have a very, very specific program that you want to share and discuss, but how can you make that experience flexible and adaptable to multiple audiences? Topics also should be marketable. Your topic will be used amongst others to market and encourage registration for the conference or the overall event. 
So when I'm developing a topic, I often write down the five points that I can share with someone to make them excited about attending that session. It's more than just a description. It's the five things I might send to a conference team that they could share via social media or via a blog or other means that can help others get excited about that presentation. And finally, the best topics also showcase your skills. The best topic should be something that you are passionate about and something that you can really deliver on from an engagement perspective when you're actually giving that presentation. Let's dive into grabbing an audience a bit more. Grabbing an audience means that it first and foremost will motivate attendance. You want to have people want to attend and participate in your session. And that's an important point because a room full of individuals, when you ask a question and no one raises their hands, no one engages when you're asking for that type of engagement, that can really present some problems for the presentation. So you want to encourage others to join with you and be part of your presentation if that's what you've planned. And this comes down to grabbing an audience to inspire active listening. Too many of us attend presentations when the lights go down in the lecture hall or the video plays and distractions seem to, to come alive. The phone is buzzing, there, there's an email there, there, there's, you know, oh, it's too cold in here, it's too warm in here. So, something else distracts you from actively listening and being part of the presentation. It's very difficult for a presenter to engage your audience for every single second they're in the room. And so while we all want to strive for that sort of perfect level, we want to make sure that we have elements in the presentation and in the topic that inspire that active listening. We also want to make sure that the presentation itself shares insights that are applicable to those who are attending that presentation. Sometimes we use examples that are so specific that they might only apply to one or 5% of those in the room. So as you're working to develop a topic, just make sure that some of the examples you're using and the illustrations you're thinking of have a, a wide variety of numbers, facts, and figures that more than one person in the room will be able to use and interpret the information that you're providing them. As far as topics being flexible and adaptable, as librarians, it is so important that we, we learn to, to treat each patron, each customer, and understand that, that they come through very, very different backgrounds. When you're looking at presentations, considering your, considering your audience is absolutely key. Whether you're in a different region, different ethnicities, different subjects, different audiences, even different venues, and different forms of delivery. Some presentations work extremely well in a panel format where you have three or four very knowledgeable individuals. Some presentations and topics don't work in that format, yet we try them anyway, and we only realize that that didn't quite go so well when we finished that presentation. But all audiences are different. A presentation prepared specifically for archivists, for example, is probably not going to be something that a general reference librarian might want to be able to sit through or get a lot out of. It all depends on how adaptable and flexible you can make that presentation. When it comes to the ability to make a particular presentation marketable for the for the team that's putting the conference together. This is something that is really key. And oftentimes I know I, as a presenter, I think about this last when I should really think about it first. It has to be digestible. And what I mean by that is someone has to be able to look at that title and look at that topic and have a good sense of what they can learn from it. If that topic seems to be way over their head or that topic seems to be too, too sort of a, at a basic level, you're not going to be able to market that presentation as well as you could if it were something that's easily understood and that excites people. And that goes into how shareable something is. In the genealogy field, we love long titles in our presentations, and we always run up against character limits on Twitter and, and other things because we like really, really long presentations or presentation titles. As you look at the title of a presentation, do you have to use all those words? Can you use other words that convey a similar meaning? How difficult is it going to be to print your title that is 10, 12, 14 words long? Of course, being in tune with potential attendees. And also when I think of a topic, I'm always thinking of something that will inspire images, something that someone will think about in their mind when they read about the topic. 
again, you're going to have to find ways to illustrate this topic with various slides or other presentation mechanics. And so you want to make sure you have a topic that inspires the attendee to think about something that they can visualize. And finally, and perhaps one of the most important elements is provide the clear with them, the what's in it for me. As an attendee, make sure your attendees know why they're there and what they're going to get out of that presentation. One thought as we look at the art of the topic is to consider the difference between a topic and a lecture. Now, this, this is something that it, some might see, well, this is splitting hairs, but if you start to look at preparing your presentation as a topic versus a lecture, this can help you to put together new topics and new ideas. So, for example, if we think about a lecture, a lecture might be on one specific topic and last, last an hour or two and be very, very detailed. But in truth, we might have several smaller topics that could be put together to form an overall lecture. For example, this presentation has sort of three main sections to it. All of those are different topics that have been put together as a lecture or a presentation. Topics in this case require something that's very specific that can then be added on top of other topics to form an overall lecture. But it's just something to think about. What are four things that have to do with the general subject that I might be able to put together as part of a cohesive presentation? And in that process, let's encounter some things that anyone who's presented has said before that we should probably rethink. The first is I can't possibly cover that topic in less than two hours. Believe me, I've thought this before, I've heard it before, and it's hard because if you're a, an expert on a particular subject, you could in many ways talk for hours and hours and hours on that subject. But if you're preparing a presentation with a 30 or 45 minute deadline, your answer to this question should be, how do I cover this topic given the 60 minutes that I have, showcase my expertise, but also make sure that the audience doesn't leave and your answer is this next question. Well, I ran over time because I wasn't able to cover all the material that the audience needed. In many cases, as the speaker, you determine what material the audience needs. Practice, time it out, take on the challenge of determining the material that, that you need that you want your audience to learn that you can fit within that given time frame. A presentation might have terrific content. If it is a half an hour over the point when it's supposed to end, your attendees are going to be missing a large part of that material. Your role as a presenter, your role as a speaker, is to present that topic within the time frame provided. If you are not sure that you can cover all the material, go back and review the material that you're actually covering and make sure that you're hitting points that are the most important thing for your audience to understand and to listen to. Topics should also have, if, if this were a, sort of the, the business world, your USP or your unique selling point. When you're looking at submissions, this is something that I really try to look for when I'm on the program side of things, and I also try and include when I'm on the presenter side or I'm submitting. And that is, why would a conference committee, why would a program committee select this session over a session that has a similar topic? Because all of us have expertise in more than one thing, and it's very possible we're going to prepare a presentation that replicates something that somebody else has done, has submitted, or, or might also be thinking about at that same time. So what is it that you offer as that presentation that's very, very unique? Maybe it's the experiences you had in a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe it's a, a sort of colleague, or maybe it's a, a group of people that you can bring together that no one else can to deliver that type of a presentation. As you go back through previous conference programs and you look at titles, Consider, why did that person submit that particular presentation, right? Who were they? How were they connected? And what did they bring to that topic that was truly unique and made that a presentation that you remembered or a presentation that was at least selected by the program committee? 
when I finish preparing a topic and I'm working up a proposal, one of the things that I will ask myself on my personal checklist is what is unique about my approach to this topic? Is this a, what we sometimes call a rinse and repeat? I could give this topic in my sleep because I give it every time. Well, there's certainly perhaps room for those in, in some settings, but conference presentations should be engaging. They should be dynamic. People will remember your presentation on the topic if you're able to make it personal, if you're able to add that approach that's unique to it. I also ask myself if my approach is new or different from what's currently available. Am I going to give a version of a presentation that someone could hear from someone else? Right? Is there something different that I'm actually providing to th this, this presentation and to my approach to it? All things to consider when you're looking at developing that topic. Is my idea actually original? And this, this is important. Sometimes we have ideas that come to us that we find are actually someone else's idea that was we thought about a couple of months later. Make sure that your idea is original and ensure that we give credit where it is due. I oftentimes get my best ideas for topics sitting in a lecture hall listening to a presentation because I'll hear something and realize that that's a part of a particular subject that I could cover or that I could develop a presentation on that I'm not seeing in front of me. But we wanna make sure that our ideas are original. Now, into some of the nitty gritty about topic and the art of the topic. As you're thinking about a topic, I have done this more than once and I know, of, I know fellow speakers who've had the same experience. I have what I think is the world's best topic. And I put together a, a proposal, it gets accepted, and I start to put together the presentation and I stare at a blank slide deck for several hours and I have no idea what to do for the presentation. Sometimes the best topics don't always yield the best presentation. As you're thinking about that proposal, as you're thinking about the submission, think all the way through to the end of the presentation. What visuals am I going to use? How am I going to represent this so that the audience isn't just staring at a slide full of text? Or if I've decided I'm not gonna use any sort of visuals, how am I going to make sure that the words that I use, how am I gonna make sure that my body language and all those other factors convey the message that I want? What about any case studies? Am I gonna use something? How can I show how applicable something is that I'm talking about to a library or to a group? What's the format? Is this a topic that really is 20 minutes of discussion? Does it need a lot of audience feedback? What happens if I get an audience of 15 people and everyone wants to talk for 15 minutes? What if I get an audience of 200 and nobody wants to talk? How flexible and adaptable will that topic be in a, a different format? And that also comes into the reception of that topic. If I'm giving a presentation in front of a, a live audience and I have planned for at least 20 minutes of interaction or questions at various times in the presentation or maybe at the very end, and I finish and there are not questions from the audience or no one participates or someone is overly excited about participating, that all can come into play for the presentation. And so as I'm putting together a presentation and a proposal, I try and think about these different elements, the visuals, the sort of examples or case studies I'm using, the format, and how it might be received by the audience as I'm developing and putting together that idea. Now, I'm not gonna have all the answers right up front because things can be very unpredictable. What it is going to allow me to do is to at least be prepared so that when I sit down to prepare the actual slides or the actual words I'm going to say, I have ideas for the different direction that I might want to go within that presentation. And we should always remember that a, what we would call a dry topic, examples, visuals, and delivery can make a dry topic very, very exciting. I, I think back to library school and you know the classes that I didn't necessarily want to take or when I'm going to a, to, a, to a conference and there are sessions that I have to attend for certain reasons, but it's not a topic that, that I get up in the morning and jump out of bed and say, yes, I'm gonna go learn about that today. But sometimes the speakers themselves make it exciting, they make it engaging. On the other hand, you can have the best visuals in the world and it will not save poor delivery and poor preparation of a topic.
Dazzling visuals cannot save poor delivery as a speaker. You might have invested a lot of time in your, your, your visuals, in charts and graphics, in your slides, and at the end, if the delivery isn't there, if the content is not there, it doesn't save that presentation. And so it's all about finding a balance, a balance between something that will show specific expertise, something that will show interest for a general audience, and topics that might be heavier or lighter. Having been on the program end of, of multiple conferences, both in, in, the, in the library field and the genealogy field and the history field, there is oftentimes a need to balance some of a lighter topic with topics that are much more heavier. It's not to say that, the, that all topics are not important in this case, but sometimes right after lunch or eight in the morning, you wanna make sure that attendees have a different type of session to sit in and participate in. And so as you're working on a topic, try and think about the time of day you would wanna deliver this presentation. Is this the type of topic that is great for after a meal or after a luncheon? when everyone is, has just gotten together and the afternoon might be creeping in, but this topic is exciting and engaging. Is this a topic that people are going to want to stay till the very end of the day to hear? Is this something that you would get up early in the morning to hear if you're not typically an early riser? Those are all just sort of considerations to keep in mind as you're looking at the engaging part of that presentation. And it is a balance. You know, I, I make mistakes all the time in topics that I submit, and even when I present things, when I forget to look at the balance overall of what's available. So it, it's a learning process, and it's all about finding that, that balance. Remember that topics should have a, a variety of content. They should highlight expertise. They should add something new. They should have something unique, something that that person will remember if they're sitting in the audience. And a session, the best presentations in my mind are often those that provide an experience. I sit there and I learn from a speaker and I hear a new idea of a program that they are working on. And it inspires me so much that I scribble it down in my notes. I send a quick email to a colleague saying, hey, we should think about doing this. But it gives me something that I remember. It provides me some sort of an experience and it reminds me the importance of investing my time in that presentation. We also have to make sure that we balance the assumptions that we might make about our audience. We oftentimes make an assumption about someone's expertise or their skill level. There is a rule of thumb in public speaking that someone shared with me when I very first started, and it's the rule of the thirds. And I think it applies to a lot of things in life, actually. A third of the people will love what you say, no matter what you say. A third of the people will disagree with you no matter what you say, because that's how it is. And a third, the other third, will show neither strong positivity or po strong negativity towards the topic, they're just there. Now, that's not true at everything, but when, you, when you're looking at different talks, there are absolutely those that attend a session and they will get everything out of every single session because that, that's who they are. You'll always have someone in the room that knows more about the topic than you do. Sometimes they'll want to share their expertise, other times they won't, but that's, that's a factor of giving a presentation. You have to make some assumptions about your audience in order to prepare the presentation. How far do you go in listing out acronyms? If you list a particular skill set or a, a particular pattern or a particular author or a particular individual, can we assume the audience is going to know who that is and they're going to understand the context behind your reference? Is your audience there with a desire to learn or are they there because they have to be? How interested is that audience going to be in actually participating in the session? Is this a topic? Is this a type of conference or event where the discussion happens outside of the presentation? It happens in the hallway. It happens in the expo space. It happens online via email. Make sure that you have reviewed some of these ideas when you're putting together that presentation. And there's nothing wrong with a little bit of marketplace research. We talk about the law of supply and demand in a lot of things. And while we don't always apply it to presentations, it's something to consider. If everyone is giving a topic on a particular subject, right now there's probably three or four main subjects that everyone's talking about. Well, what are you going to offer that's unique to that? Or maybe that's something that 
you're not going to, to jump in on. Maybe you're going to work on a different type of, of topic. So do a little bit of research, look at different conferences, view different states and library associations and see what, what topics are out there and who the speakers are and see what, what's in the field, what's available, what's not available as you try and think of that presentation that might fill a, a gap or something that's missing in the current availability. Also remember that subject expertise does not always equal lecture expertise. You might be asked to prepare a presentation on a topic that you do not feel comfortable with or a topic that you're worried about standing for an audience. What if I get a question from someone and I don't know the answer? Be honest, I don't know the answer to that. There's also likely topics that you can give, that you can present on that you haven't considered yet because in your eyes, they might be too fundamental or they might be too quote unquote basic but they could be the exact topic that that program is looking for. Survey your colleagues, survey those you work with, the questions that you had when you were first starting out or questions that you have every single day that you're wishing there was a presentation on. There's probably topics and ideas that you have within your own experiences that you haven't had a chance to explore yet. It doesn't have to be that extremely sort of unique, you know, shiny object presentation that, that's, that's only going to be given once. It can be some topics that fill some of the fundamentals for those that are seeking continuous education or even those that are starting out or are looking to refresh some of their skill sets and see things through someone else's experience. In, in genealogy and family history, we often have this, this conversation about what we call sort of basic record topics. How many times can you attend a talk on using a site like Ancestry or the census or vital records? Well, in truth, a lot of us like to attend the presentations on, on what we would consider very fundamental record types because that approach from that particular researcher, the perspective they bring to it is unique and teaches something new. And the same thing can be applied to different groups and, and different organizations. So consider that. Also, Consider other ideas like setting up a Google alert. If there is a particular speaker you heard at a conference and you, you're interested in what they do and different topics, set up a Google alert to, so you can see when they're presenting next. I do this all the time for subjects that I'm interested in. Right, That way I see what presentations are, are coming up. And there, in some cases, might be a topic that you develop for a specific society or for a specific association or, or a specific event. Think about things that are location and subject-based, topics that are based on different anniversaries or major events that are occurring. There's all sorts of different ways to bring in some of those, those topics and to sort of add them to your list of overall presentations that you might be prepared to submit. We also should, should be practical. In, in the library world, there are limited speaking venues. No one is paying a librarian $5 million to come give a keynote presentation in front of 10,000 people. I, I shouldn't say no one. I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's one exception out there. But we're not necessarily giving presentations to bank in the millions of dollars from being a public speaker. We have limited speaking venues. And in some cases, we have the big fish, little pond situation. Many of us are colleagues. We know one another. And so we have to be practical about what we, what we submit and what we prepare. This also means that your presentation doesn't have to be just you. Look around you and look at the opportunities that are there. Where are areas where you can collaborate and work with others, whether they're panelists, whether it's a joint presentation, whether it's a study you work on together and then present, all sorts of, of different things that you could do, but you have to be very, very practical about, about the process. So that wraps up some thoughts on at least the art of the topic. So you have, you have a, a great topic and you're, you're, you're working on it, you're getting ready to submit the presentation, and this is sometimes where we get stuck, right? Some of the best topics that I think a lot of speakers have end up stuck in a random notepad somewhere, sitting in their head because they haven't written them down, or on an empty you know, document that they just, they just can't quite get the words onto the page. So how do we submit that successful presentation? First, we should embrace variances in location, audience, time, and in other factors. I happen to give a lot of presentations in the New York area. So a lot of, a lot of presentations that I give have a sort of have New York examples and a New York flair to them. 
I also give presentations in California. I would never dream of preparing the same topic for New York that I would give in, in California if there is variations that I need to remember in the audience that's there and the location and in, in all sorts of, of other variants. So make sure that we're embracing those when we're doing our submission. Now let's talk about quote unquote new lectures. A different title does not make a lecture new. However, titles could be adapted as long as you're honest and upfront and set clear expectations. Remember content is king. Again, the best visuals in the world will not save a presentation that's weak on overall content. When you're developing a new lecture or a new presentation, consider the content that you're including and then make sure that if it really is something that's brand new, that you're, you're upfront about that. But also sometimes there might be essential parts of a presentation that, that you wanna provide. So just things to think about when you're putting together a submission that's for an actual quote unquote new lecture. Now, reading the call, the call for papers, call for presentations, call for proposals, what, what, whatever it is that particular event is using. Some conferences will have a conference theme and organizers will try and base the presentation around that conference theme. Other times you can read the call and you'll find specific requests for topics. As a, as a program organizer, I cannot emphasize to you enough, look for those specific requests and think of what topics and presentations that you can deliver. That means that that committee or that organization has specifically worked and they want to ensure that they have a presentation that covers this particular subject area. And sometimes we submit things that we're very comfortable with. We don't submit something that might be a little bit outside of, of the line, so to speak, as in, in what we might present at a conference. Look at those specific requests. Look at deadlines and also look at requirements. What's going to be needed? Some submission processes require a detailed sort of outline of the presentation. Some of them just want a, a brief description and then a paragraph or two summary. That is entirely up to the conference, but read the call and make sure that you're not just doing a cut and paste from a previous submission into, into something that might not fit the right format. As you're looking at your submission, Look for advantages that you bring to the topic. I always approach it with the mindset of, why would a conference organizer pick me to deliver this topic versus two or three other people that have submitted the same thing? What is it that I'm gonna bring to this topic that's going to be unique? Sometimes it's a strength that you have or something that you're still developing. Sometimes it might be a topic where there is a limited number of people that speak on that topic or that have that subject expertise. Look for those advantages as you're preparing your submissions. It depends on the venue. It depends on a, a lot of situations when you're talking about how many presentations to submit. In, in the genealogy world, for example, you know, we, we could submit up to six or eight presentations for a single conference, knowing that two or three might be chosen if we're very lucky. In other situations, it's frowned upon to submit multiple presentations. This is where, if it is not clearly stated in the call, ask. Ask how many you can submit. If you have time to put together two or three presentations, then by all means, maybe that's the direction that you want to take. All of us probably have more than one topic that we're preparing or thinking of. So think about multiple topics that you might want to submit. As a, as a presenter, do not be discouraged. Presentations and submissions far outnumber, in most cases, the number of slots. You know, I've, I've, I've worked with conferences where, you know, th there's more than a thousand submissions and there's only 120 slots. And amongst those submissions, there's a lot of duplicate topics. Sometimes there's outside limitations. Funding might be tight to bring in and pay for speakers in a particular area. Maybe there, there is no compensation for the conference and limitations include the type of topics that are there. There's room sizes. They can only have four running at a time or one running at a time. Do not be discouraged when you get that very, very nice thanks but no thanks letter. I, I still get them. I, I got them in the beginning and I still get them. Be gracious and if you feel that you can, you can always ask for feedback. 
and this depends again on, on how comfortable you are with the organizers or with the event. You can always ask for written feedback, a phone call, a quick chat, just to see if there was a reason why your presentation might not have been selected. You can also ask for feedback when you are selected. Try and figure out what it was about that presentation that made that conference committee say, yes, I want that. That's something that we don't often do. We're so happy to get the invitation that we say thank you and we go right to work. Oftentimes what I have learned when I ask for feedback with a presentation that's been accepted is I figure out how to tailor it more specifically to that conference audience. We pick this presentation because we really like this element, or we pick this presentation because no one has ever submitted that before. That gives me some ideas as I go about preparing the time I'm gonna spend with attendees to make sure that they're gonna make the most out of every second they're with me in that particular session. And you can always support and attend events even if you don't happen to be selected as a speaker. Be, be gracious in this process and understand that in, in most cases, of course, it's not someone saying we don't want you, it's someone saying this presentation doesn't fit for this particular event. As you are preparing your submission, your description is an agreement between yourself and the conference planning team. Titles are important with this, but your description is an agreement. We've probably all sat in that presentation once or twice that perhaps doesn't meet up with the description. I thought they were gonna talk about this and yet they're talking about all these other things with a brief mention of the reason why, I why I'm here. Your description from the beginning should be thought of in your mind as an agreement for what you're going to deliver to the audience. It's also an agreement with your audience members, with your attendees. When I read a presentation and I look at the title and I look at the description, that's what I'm expecting when I walk in the door. So keep that in mind in your submission as you're putting it together and of course in your preparation. At very least, at the least before you actually press submit on that button, prepare an outline for the presentation and make sure that it's something that you can cover that will meet that description within the time you have allotted. This is key. I have submitted presentations before that I thought were great. And when I actually read the description, I realize that it might take two hours to deliver what I have 30 minutes to, to, to actually share. So prepare that outline and then revisit that description as you work through the submission process. Meet your deadlines, aim to be early to keep, to keep the conference committee running smoothly. You know, for every person that meets a deadline, there's probably one or two that might miss that deadline. Meet your deadlines, follow, follow your, your commitments, read any agreements that you might have thoroughly. But remember that submission process, what is it that you're going to bring into that presentation that's unique and particularly will help to engage the audience? So we have some topics we've, we've submitted and congratulations, our, our topic's been selected. And now the question is, how do I prepare and how do I make this delivery the most engaging and educational and informative experience possible? That's a high bar because the distractions that your attendees face are huge, whether they're at home watching a video of your presentation or they're, they're sitting at a conference where they're distracted by being away from the office or having questions and meeting and networking with colleagues. There's all sorts of things that can take your audience away from the presentation. So in this, think carefully about what the presentation actually is. It is very, very easy, and we call it, quote unquote, death by PowerPoint or keynote for those, those Mac users out there. Death by PowerPoint is such a real thing. Slide after slide after slide full of text with monotone speaking, with no variation, moving forward, now this point, now that point, now that point, now that point, now that point. Oh, <laughs> we, we've all sat through those presentations before. Your slides and your illustrations should be used to enhance the presentation, not necessarily be the presentation. When I'm practicing my presentations, I usually at least once run through the presentation with no visuals whatsoever. I have an outline in front of me on paper, I turn off the computer and I present as if the projector died just before I was supposed to give the presentation. Why? Because your slides should not be the only thing your audience pays attention to. They are illustrations, they should guide your audience through the point, 
but if you put every word you're going to say on a slide and you you give it to all your attendees what 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 do they benefit when they walk in and hear you give the presentation so always consider create your slides as an illustration as an addition to that presentation but build your presentation first and then figure out how slides can illustrate those specific talks Use different components, texts and visuals, stories and examples. Not everything looks great as a chart. Not everything looks great as a picture. Sometimes a presentation might have 30 slides. 29 of them are all pictures. Well, that's, that's great in some circumstances if that's how the story is being told or if that's how that presentation is given. But sometimes people like that visual reference point with text on a slide use these different components as you start to illustrate your presentation for some topics when i'm particularly stuck on how to make it engaging i will literally draw out my slides by hand on paper this is what i'm going to be talking about what's the best illustration to use is it a graphic that sort of comes in and moves to the side is it a video is it is it an image is it a table how do i use animation effectively these are all things that we should think about when we're building that sort of slide deck or building visuals for that presentation. Make sure that your presentation follows a concrete structure. Introduce yourself, say hello to, to attendees, make, make your agreement with them. Here's what we're gonna be covering. Make sure that things have main points and make sure you wrap things up in a conclusion. Sometimes when I'm speaking, one of, one of my downfalls is that I will sort of get off on a tangent because there's something that the audience is particularly relating to well, or I want to make sure I emphasize this point, and I forget to tie a bow around it, right? I forget to conclude that and bring it back in. Having that concrete structure and signposting for your attendees helps to keep them engaged. Remember, your attendees are unlikely to listen and retain every single word you use. Make sure that you emphasize your main points so that they can come back if they've gotten distracted for a few seconds or a few moments, and make sure that you tie a bow around different concepts so you deliver an introduction, your main points, and finally your conclusion. Looking at preparing presentations and things that can distract your attendees. Well, sometimes you can't control those, but other times you can. Colors are a huge factor light versus dark text, room variations, how, where's the windows in the room? How light is the room? How dark is the room? How big a screen do I have? What's the quality of the projector? I've given presentations where there was a sheet tacked up on a wall that was used as a projection screen. My visuals looked horrible because I, I thought wrongly that I would have a, a, a big projection screen. I didn't. Are you gonna be able to see your computer? Are you not gonna be able to see your computer? These are all things that you should consider when you're preparing that presentation. This presentation, this template has a lot of purple and pink in it. There are probably people out there that say, I hate purple and pink. Why is the presentation in purple and pink? That will distract them from the presentation. Your backgrounds and your templates matter. Everything from consistency to branding, but they also can be a distraction use your visuals and use your templates to train your audience by now in this presentation you've you've seen that i put bullet points exactly with the triangles in the exact same space whenever i have a bullet point of a list of things that i'm discussing the audience is trained to look there for the next point when they see that template come up when you use visuals when you use different graphics train your audience where they can expect to see a chart if you use similar animations, rather than doing a different animation on every single slide, train your audience to what they can expect for that animation. They will then be anticipating when you introduce new topics. Again, your template and your presentation style trains your audience. If you don't begin something with an introduction and you don't wrap something up with a conclusion, they'll become trained to know that you're not going to wrap up or tie a bow around what you're saying. Visually in your slide deck, the same thing comes into play. All, all your visuals, all your illustrations, they should be used to guide your audience through, not necessarily become a, a big distraction. For, for those that use PowerPoint or Keynote that are putting together a slide deck, master templates are very helpful for this because they help to, to increase that engagement. Make sure that you keep the animation under control. 
Make sure that your placement of things are appropriate. Your footers, your headers, your fonts, all of these are factors that you can control within sort of that master template. Take an hour and explore creating your own master template within PowerPoint or, or within Keynote so you can figure out how it works and it will save you countless hours on the back end. Fonts. Limit the number of fonts you use in a presentation. Sometimes we like to get very fancy with fonts because we think it's illustrative and it's fun. All we're doing is training our audience to not know what to expect. Once your audience learns what font you're using, they begin to remember, well, that's what a T looks like. That's what an L looks like. That's what a D looks like. Keep the size above 24 so folks can read and avoid your serifs. I put a couple of, of fonts on this particular slide to show examples of things that, again, don't have the, the fancy sort of serif afterwards that, that are difficult to read on a bigger screen. Very, very when you bold or unbold text. Again, the eye gets tired reading bold text time after time and, and again. So again, it's, it's just all about making sure your visuals engage rather than distract your, your participants that are part of that presentation. When you're working with images and figures, label your images as needed, especially if you've licensed an image and you have to protect copyright or you wanna make sure that, that you're protecting someone's rights. Make sure they give your presentation a very polished look. There's times when, when I've seen slide decks that aren't necessarily the, the best because they have images that are blurry or distracting. And sometimes we use too many images or we use too much text and images on a single slide. Use images that are effective. Clip art is frowned upon in a lot of circles. Balance the images and the text that you use. Remember that a, a visual is not neutral. The minute you put up a visual, it either attracts or detracts from the presentation because people are either gonna ignore it, they're gonna look at it, they might only be focusing on that. And just a, a tip for, a, for sort of PowerPoint and, and Keynote users, when you're putting in images, go up to the, to the menu and actually insert the image rather than cut, cutting and pasting that image. It'll make your file size smaller overall so your PowerPoint can move around and you have less of a chance in that case of sort of losing your images. But just a, a sort of tip there as you're, as you're working with images in, in PowerPoint or in Keynote. The same thing with, with text. Avoid entire paragraphs of text. Balance text with images as needed and remember that your slide text is not a script. Practice giving your presentation without reading every word on the slide. And align text where possible. Again, remember your slides and your deck is training your audience where to look for key points. Make sure that you're introducing concepts gradually and not all at once. A chart or another graphic does not have to appear in its complete form immediately. You can introduce them one at a time. You can introduce them gradually. When it's a key point, use different font sizes to illustrate that particular point or those factors that you want to share. Animation and transitions can be terrific, but in some cases they can distract. Again, a dazzling animation can be great, but is that really the content that that person is there for? And when you're presenting via a webinar format, remember that you have refresh and load time happening on someone's computer. And so someone who's sitting at home on a slower internet connection might not be able to see the animations at the speed that they're coming in. So I, I usually try and take away my animations when I'm presenting in a webinar format, just to try and meet the needs of, of attendees. And then there's all of the details, the widescreen versus full screen. I prepare every presentation I give in a widescreen format by default, and then I will create a full screen version if that's the size that I'm gonna be using. I ask beforehand. And I practice lighting, I practice sound, I practice with screen size, I might practice with equipment. The worst thing to do, don't ever get a brand new presentation remote five minutes for your presentation. It's, not, it's, it's never gonna work the way you want it to work. You're gonna be figuring out something new. But test, test how your slides look. When I'm presenting at a conference, I will always try and arrange a time to go in and load my slide up on the screen. I'll ask them to set the lights in the room, how they're going to be during the presentation. So I learn how it's going to look. It's how I learn that I might have a particular image that is 
isn't going to show well because of the walls or because of the texture. Sometimes the, the walls have a sort of gradient on them, which makes which makes that the light refract differently. Things that you learn that all go into building that engaging presentation. And it's okay to start to explore and use some of the unique tools. So one of the things that are in recent versions of PowerPoint is this design idea feature. It's up there on, on the right. And so you can literally take a slide and hit design ideas and it will show you different elements that you might use for that slide. It's a really, really easy way to create some clean, slick graphics that look really nice for your audience. Now, in another two years, we're probably not gonna be using that anymore because everyone's gonna be using design ideas and everyone's presentations are, are going to be looking very, very, very similar. But it's just things that you can do to make that engagement at, at, a, at a higher level just by keeping a, a sort of clean and, and a crisp sl slide element. Also make sure that you're using presentation and presenter mode when you're giving your, your presentation. Presenter mode lets you see notes, you can see upcoming talks, it lets you see what, what's on the screen, it lets you see what's coming up. You can then navigate from session to session. Presenter mode saves your life when you're running out of time because you can skip ahead several slides without your audience seeing you sort of advance, 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 advance. Again, practice and learn how to use presentation mode. Screen grab images when you can. I, I never present with live internet sites if, if, I, if I can because you never know what's gonna happen. All it takes is a, is a slower site, something being changed. Use things like Snagit and other features to create those interesting presentations and those different sort of types of, of dynamics. And remember, your presentation doesn't have to live in PowerPoint or in slides. It can live in things like Prezi. I, I've seen a lot of librarians start to use Prezi for different presentations, and it's, it's great. Prezi is, is simply, the idea that you have a, a giant presentation, almost like a poster, and you then can zoom into different parts of that poster as you're giving your presentation. And so you, you go to different spaces, you sort of zoom in, add different topics, and then zoom out as, you, as you're giving your presentation. Again, it doesn't work for every presentation, but it can be a very compelling visual for someone that's trying to avoid having a very, very long slide deck that isn't at all at all beneficial for someone as, as they're going through their particular presentation. So remember, slides and visuals come last. Create your presentation, not simply a long deck of slides for you to get through as you're, you're discussing and as you're presenting your topic. Some final thoughts for in, engagement and how to make sure that your attendees walk out of the room remembering that presentation. Set expectations with your audience. From the very beginning, what are they going to learn? What are they here for? What, what, what are they going to get out of this presentation, the with them? What, what's in it for them? Set those expectations. Be sensitive. You will have audience members that might not feel comfortable asking a question. It's very, very rare that someone raises their hand and asks a question that three or four other people in the room do not have as well. Be sensitive in that case. When you're answering a question, repeat the question in case somebody didn't hear it be sensitive to, to your audience. Keep current in your presentations. Check your URLs, check your screenshots. Make sure that you're giving a current version of that particular topic. You can never practice enough for a presentation until you, you sort of are, are a couple days out and then I think you can over practice. Practice your delivery, practice your body language and remember, don't let the slides or the visuals drive your presentation turn off the screen and give it, give it straight, give it with that, without any visuals, without any distractions and practice that way and, and see, see what you can do. Watch your body language. It is, it is interesting, I'm a, you can't see the video, I'm a hand talker, my hands have been waving this, this whole time. And sometimes when I give presentations, the comments I get back have nothing to do with the content. It's all about your hands were waving the entire time, it was so distracting. No, that, that, that means you didn't pay attention to what I had to say because I was, my body language was distracting. But make sure that you watch your body language. If you are particularly nervous about it or you want to improve, video yourself giving the presentation and then watch it on mute. So you don't hear anything that you're saying, you simply see it. You'll be amazed at the things that you pick up by not listening to yourself, but just watching yourself present and you'll, be, you'll become a better presenter because you'll start to identify things to work on. Don't do that three days before you have to give the presentation. 
do it a week or so after you've given the presentation and then give notes to yourself as, as you work to make improvements. Use effective technology. Sometimes a, a slide deck can be great, but if it's you're using presenter view for the first time, or let's say you're using a brand new remote or a different computer, it, it can have issues. It, it can affect the, the presentation. Use effective technology. Don't spend time, don't invest time in fancy animations or in videos if it isn't going to be effective in the presentation. Dress professionally as a speaker. Dress as, as, as you would want a presenter to sort of walk into a room and make sure that you're meeting the standards of that event. That doesn't mean that it's that it's suit and tie for every presentation. Dress dress professionally, dress for the event. There are some events that I've spoken at that are, are more tech in nature and to walk in a suit, people raise their eyebrow at you. That's a jeans and a polo type of crowd, but dress professionally. And most importantly, make sure that you're acting professionally as you give that presentation. Your word choice, th things you say, how you greet your audience, how you work with, with the program committee, act professionally. Remember that no one knows how it was supposed to go except for you. You're the only person that knows that that slide was out of order, unless you tell the entire audience, whoops, sorry, my slides are out of order. Act professionally. Whether or not you realize it, you bring a part of yourself into each presentation. And quite honestly, as an attendee, that's one of my favorite parts of any educational event, is the part of themselves that they brought into that presentation their smile, their experience, the, the sort of glisten in their eye when they talk about a particular patron services program that they're working on. You bring that into the presentation. And remember that, whether or not you realize what part it is of yourself that you sort of brought in, you've brought in something. So keep that in mind. Protect yourself as, as a speaker. You know, there, there are times when you will have, have agreed to do something that's an hour and there might have been a miscommunication and you get there and suddenly you have two hours to fill. You can do all the sort of review and spend all the time that, that, that you need to making sure you're protected, but always make sure that you do protect yourself. Read thoroughly, ask questions, but also understand that sometimes mistakes and miscommunications absolutely happen. Say thank you. Right, I'm, you know, I personally am grateful that this event this year went online so that I can participate and I can attend and I can learn from it. But say thank you to your attendees. Thank you to those who are organizing the conference. Sometimes it's a quick email, sometimes it might be a handwritten note, but say thank you. Make sure that you're thinking beyond the event. Sometimes we look at, at our events as a one hour presentation and then we're done. Well, if you inspire some of that presentation with a couple of thoughts and you've given an email address, think beyond the event. They're going to be contacting you for that. If there's parts of the presentation that you couldn't fit into your 50 minutes or your 30 minutes, what else might you offer? What else might you provide through your library's website or through another program that helps your audience think sort of beyond that event? End your thoughts and repeat your key points. Make sure that you, again, tie that nice bow around what you're saying while repeating some of those key points. That's key. Again, tell them what you're going to say, you know, you know, tell them and then repeat what you've just said. That helps your audience remain engaged and knowledgeable about the subject. One of the difficult things, and this, this, is, why I, this is why I put the slide in, in pink, balance leaving them wanting more and wondering if their time was well spent. That's so hard because you will always put in content that one person views as too little and another person views as too much. What I like to hear after a presentation is, I got a lot out of that presentation and I want to learn more because it tells me that I taught something, but I also shared that this is only an hour, this is only one piece of something and someone was able to take that information and then they want to, to learn more. Accept constructive criticism. There will be someone in the room that notes the mistake you made. I'm, I'm a king of typos on my slides, I know it. I always have someone that afterwards, they slip me a note or they raise their hand and let me know that I misspelled a word on, on slide four. Great, I'll fix it. Ex accept that type of criticism. It, it will happen when, when you venture into public speaking and, and preparing different presentations. Stand up for yourself. 
right? Make sure that you you address your audience's questions, but also send up for yourself. Don't feel like you have to answer every question in a detailed format. Be courteous, be professional, and be respected, but also stand up for yourself when you need to. And know your limits. One of the hardest things to do is to get a question and realize that you have no idea how to answer that. Tip number one, will you please repeat that question? That gives you more time to think and sort of sometimes they'll rephrase it in a way that helps you to grasp what, what actually they're, they're asking for. But if you don't know, simply say, I don't know, or I don't know, but I'm gonna, I'll look into that. If you contact me afterwards, I'll certainly see what answers I can come up with. Or refer to a colleague that would know the answer. Remember the audience. Your audience is there to, to be a part of, of your presentation. Don't forget them as you're speaking. Make sure that you keep them engaged. Remember, they're there to learn from you. If all the eyes are glazed over and, and sort of falling asleep, it might be time to switch tactics a little bit in, in the presentation. Stop tinkering with your presentation. Stop messing with your slides. They'll never be perfect. They will be what they will be. If you've planned time to prepare the slides ahead of time, that's great. Stop tinkering with colors and graphics and, and animations right before a presentation. And finally, and the most important thing that, that I would like everyone to remember is to keep innovating. When you are preparing submissions and you're, you're working to create something that's engaging and informative, innovation is key. You have knowledge, you have experiences that will help others learn. Never, ever, ever stop thinking about how you can adapt those experiences to, to wider audiences. How can you make something different? How can you share something brand new with an audience? The information that you have, it might not seem exciting to you in the beginning, but think about what you could do if you apply it in a different way. Think about what you can do if you get together with three or four colleagues and discuss a common problem and a solution you've come up with, and you each, you each present the version of that solution. Again, never stop innovating because that's how we continue submitting and preparing engaging conference presentations. Now, I want to thank you for listening. And again, you know, thank you to the association for, for doing the conference online. And for all of you out there that are, are working to sort of submit and prepare presentations, don't give up. Have fun. And I can't wait. I'll be in the, I'll be in the front row if you want me to and happy to listen to everything that I can learn from the, the amazing talent and the incredible colleagues that are out there. Thank you so much, Joshua. That was very informative. Um, this concludes the NILA 2020 On Demand program, submitting and preparing engaging conference presentations. We hope you continue to take advantage of all the on demand and live programs the NILA 2020 annual virtual conference has to offer. Thank you so much for helping us make this the best virtual conference ever.